This is the Open Global Mind weekly call for Thursday, September 12th, 2024. Um, we are just post the Kamala and Donald debate, which was a almost like a world wrestling event. It was really kind of fun uh, in a nail biting kind of way. <laughs> yes. Um, today we have a check in format, which um, uh, Jamey, it's your first time here uh, for doing this, so I will uh, describe it briefly. Um, I will step aside. Usually I'm playing sort of a facilitator for the meeting, but in check-in, let me just do a little background. We wound up realizing that we have a lot of sort of quick conversations and with not without a lot of pauses. And then we started really appreciating the pauses. And um, so then we decided to do these check-in rounds to see what everybody was up to. And we alternate uh, formats uh, week by week. One week is check-in, the next week is a topic. And often we come up with the topic the week, you know, two weeks back. Uh, and for check-in, I basically step aside and don't facilitate. And anybody steps in whenever they feel like it until everybody has checked in only once. Uh, we try to avoid getting into conversation during check-in, which is the normal thing we do uh, in our regular discourse. We don't use the chat during check-in, which for people like Pete Kaminsky and me is a, a really difficult, thorny thing because we are just compelled to share what the length of the, of the, the book the person just mentioned or whatever hold off until everybody's checked in. And then we just, you know, uh, I let the dogs loose and everybody pours whatever they've got onto the chat. Um, but pauses are great. If you want to uh, wait, uh, you know, wait a little bit before jumping in, we love that. Uh, you can hold up your hand as Judy has done because she has to leave us in a half hour. You can hold up your hand to get in the queue or if there's no hands up, you can just step in and start talking. Again, I will only facilitate if somebody who hasn't been through this before shows up or if there's some bump in the process. Or as we did last two weeks ago, a few people get carried away and start entering one of those conversation things. Pete, hi, I was just describing how hard it is for you and me not to pour things into the chat during check-in mode. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just in our nature. It's just, we gotta be who we gotta be. Uh, um, anything for the cause. Anything okay for the it. cause, exactly, exactly. Um, so nice to see everybody, uh, glad to see y'all coming in and I am now officially going to step aside until I check in and then I'll uh, bring us back to normal sequence when we've all checked in. So uh, uh, Judy needs to leave in a half hour to go get some boosters. So uh, I think it's clear she's going to go first. Thanks. Should I step in now, Terry? Okay. Um, so yes, I'm going to get boosters because I'm going to Washington DC next week for the national meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And the main reason that I'm going to their meetings, which I don't usually do, is because I've been selected to receive a AAAS Fellows Award at the meeting. So there's a presentation ceremony with a forum and a formal gala in the evening. So I spent last night figuring out what clothes to take. And um, it's a very large society. It, it is the world's largest professional society. I mean, scientific society, and it covers all disciplines of science. So it's really pretty exciting. There's subsections for all its sub, sub areas and so forth. But anyway, I was shocked to, well, I was surprised to be nominated um, and then very surprised to win. So I'm excited to go for that. And uh, it should be a good time. My daughter and her, my, and her husband are coming out to join me at the meeting. So I have some family watching the recognition process. <laughs> so that's my check-in. <laughs> Otherwise, I just came back from a week at Canyon Ranch, which I heartily recommend to anyone who hasn't ever been there. It's a health and wellness spa in Tucson. It was unbelievably hot, but very, very dry. And as long as you did everything outdoors before about 11 o'clock, it was okay. Um, but they have kind of everything for everybody. You can go after medical incidents. They have a full medical team there that'll help you kind of readjust your life in the light of some substantial change. There's nutritional content, exercise content, spiritual content. It's just the full gamut. So if you've never been there or never heard of it, you might want to look it up on the web. It's just uh, Canyon Ranch Tucson, T-U-C-S-O-N, which was the original and the largest site that they have. And they've got 
lots and lots and lots of acres at the base of the Foothill Mountains there. And so you've got a gorgeous view of the mountains every day and you can hike to your heart's content um, or do any number of other things, high rope activities. I mean, it's just that the catalog is kind of overwhelming in terms of the number of things going on all the time every day. So that's my full check-in. I think I'll jump right in. Um, I was thinking about the fact that it was check-in day today, and the, the thought occurred to me that it feels that check-ins are too frequent. Um, and I wondered if if um, if the idea of checking in once a month rather than every two weeks made uh, made sense to anybody. But just a just a thought. Um, Seems like a lot changes in two weeks and not enough changes in two weeks. Um, and uh, and so, so that was a thought. As for me, I'm, um, I've been working uh, hard on, on all the projects, the, the, our collabs, our, our protocols and uh, our community projects with Doug and others. Um, and one of the things that I'm I'm realizing is that there is so much uh, local community work to be done uh, with these projects that always feel like they're so much they're so big and at scale and yet um, the the guys down the street need help. Uh, so that's which is a passion of mine. So that that's feeling like a, a good place to uh, to work with. Uh, the cooperatives here locally and the, and the uh, community businesses that are that are here in the area and uh and so i'm starting to get excited about that because that that gets your fingers dirty and um that that's kind of fun so um yeah and that that's about it for me like i said not enough changes a lot changes so uh maybe it's uh, an opportunity for us to engage in other topics um and maybe do this every every three weeks rather than every every other week. That's it for me.
I'll go next. I can just go really quickly. Yeah, I think I um, could reiterate um, Jose's point. I think that might be a good idea because I don't know, you know, I mean, I'm kind of doing the same things myself repeatedly. Uh, there's a lot going on, you know, I'm, I'm constantly doing um, Zoom calls, meeting <clears throat> new groups and what whatnot. This morning I had a really interesting conversation with a Unitarian um, individual from Michigan who has a large network uh, and they're trying to do some grassroots um, work in Pennsylvania because they're really concerned about, you know, losing our democracy um, and suddenly so, they feel that Pennsylvania is pivotal. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that he um, illuminated this morning to myself is that, you know, the, the Christian denomination is huge. The Catholic denomination is huge in America. It's you know, predominant, right? And so getting them uh, on board towards a, a, a mission of unity, uh, you know, changing the culture, democracy, focusing on that and, and uh, economics is going to be critical. So one way or another, we're going to have to uh, unite them. We're going to have to um, utilize them um, to, towards any 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 change that we may wish. Like myself, as you guys may know, I'm attempting to do some large scale changes at a national level or global level, which is obviously challenging. It'll take many years, hopefully not decades. Um, but anyway, so that was kind of a new twist for myself. You know, I was aware of the Unitarians, um, you know, early on, but just the notion that we have to somehow tie in the religion into this as well and you utilize them and the Pope, because the Pope, I don't know if the, I mean, you guys have read his, uh, it's called the La loudest sea or whatever his, uh, his document was really impressive uh, and it's all about unity it's all about you know equity it's all about you know bringing the world together and working together so anyway so i'll leave it at that thanks guys I love the Quaker meeting-ish aspect of our check-in calls when we actually have pauses. In the last couple of check-ins, we've been pretty quick through everybody, and now we're actually going slow. And it's, it's taking me back to the late 80s, early 90s when I lived in Connecticut and attended Wilton Monthly Meeting, which is pretty much the only time in my life I regularly attended friends meeting. But it, it affected me uh, enormously to do that. And the quality of presence is lovely. It's really, it's a, it's a delightful thing. Um, that said, uh, Jose, I think that moving to once a month might be a, a good idea. We can talk about that when we get into a conversational mode. Um, uh, this is a big week for me because I've invested a whole bunch of uh, time and treasure into uh, our speakers reel that I mentioned on the OGM list. Um, I am looking for speaking business, et cetera. But it's been exciting to, the work of doing that has been the work of synthesizing what I do and trying to simplify it because I'm curious about too many things and do too many things. Uh, it also means you put yourself out in front of everybody you've ever rubbed shoulders with. So I have a monster spreadsheet, you know, and I'm ticking through through it, sending off a, an email that says, hey, guess what? I've got a thing. And it feels really awkward. Um, but it's uh, it's the thing it's the thing you sort of have to do, but it also reconnects you with a lot of people that, that you'd like to connect with, which is nice. Uh, and then on the same day, on Tuesday, there was the debate, which was a nail like like white knuckle ride even though it was obvious pretty early that 
that Trump was just spiraling downward into. I was amazed that, that the answer to all the world's problems apparently is to stop the, the tsunami of terrible people being sent to us through the southern border that, you know, you can name abortion, all the issues, right, like circle right back to that. It's astonishing. Um, and then uh, Taylor Swift uh, endorsing Kamala afterward was almost its own news event. It's all really interesting. And the fact that we have instantaneous access to too much of all this is the one of the big marks of our time. It's one of the big signifiers of where we are in life. And I, I think I'm dwelling on that a lot, just the, the instantaneity and connectivity that we now take for granted that wasn't there just a little while ago when I used to attend friends meeting in Connecticut. Uh, that you know that the, the, the technology set back then was really dramatically different than what's going on right now. And I think the technology is in our faces every day all the time. Now with Gen AI even more so. And we've been talking a lot about Gen AI uh, here and in lots of other places in our communities. Um, so that that's all like filling my head. And uh, with that, just as Kevin joins the call, I am complete. Uh, Kevin, we're in check-in mode in case you didn't see the email. Okay. <clears throat> well, I will check in uh, if that's okay. Uh, I've been working with the Cherokee on the memorial to the massacre that was launched on our land that I have talked about. Then I was reaching out to another tribe, <clears throat> and it turns out that that tribe is in a fight with the Cherokee. And so I had to spend two hours... Uh, talking to the Cherokee about how I haven't made any commitments with that other tribe and healed that relationship to the point that I can drive out and talk to them and their relatives uh, in the town of Cherokee later today for another couple hours. You know, working with tribes is complicated. And that, that's really all I have to say. It's, it wore me out, you know, in two hours. To like, anyway, this guy kind of misbehaved. And anyway. Being the, being the white guy in the middle of a tribal fight is, is, is you know, it's, there's no, there's no ground you can stand on. You just say sorry to everybody and hope you survive. Can I just ask a quick question? I'm just curious how many, how many women were involved in the negotiations? Um, to, this afternoon, I'm going out to meet with his aunties. And uh, the, the aunties are kind of, the, the Cherokee is a really interesting uh, under the cover uh, uh, matriarchal thing where, you know, I've, I've had some friends that know that, you know, the, when the head man is messing up and, and his woman leaves and then takes up with another man, that man can be the head man. Uh, but this was two guys, and I'm going out to meet with him and his aunties and some other folks. Uh, so, uh, if, if anyway. we can, if we can refrain from going into questions and answers during check-in, that would be great. Um, we can ask no. when when we when we've all checked in. We can uh, go. To, I'm going to have to leave questions. quickly, but anyway, just that, thank okay. you for the check-in. Yeah, and thanks for that. What you did, Kevin. I can go. Mm. Can we post things in chat? Uh, during check-in, no chat. Uh, as soon as we we're all done checking in individually uh, and briefly, then chat is uh, like usual. Okay. So I was going to post. You've just been F dollar sign percent squiggle um, uh, hashtag D by psyops UFOs magic, electronic warfare, mind control, artificial intelligence, and the death of the internet, a art, technology, and culture colloquia um, talk by Trevor Paglin. Um, and Ken Goldberg at UC Berkeley has been doing these since 1997. He's done about 300. I've been to a, only about 180 of them. Um, art is talking about technology and culture. Um, it was great um uh, how um basically the cia um and you know psyops have been around since 
Sun Tzu and the Art of War and before. And UFOs are basically created by you know, the Air Force to basically find where, who the crazies are. Um, and um, very fascinating history. Um, interspersed with, uh, you know, you know me, I take notes. So got tons of notes there to type in later. Um, black zones, you know, basically he's a man who received the MacArthur Genius Award um, for doing very early artificial intelligence and anti-artificial intelligence art. Um, personally, um, I've got my, uh, your service has been suspended. Please pay bill now. For those of you who don't know, um, I've had cancer and post-cancer PTSD and um, I'm diverse. So uh, basically uh, got fired um, and I'm free, which is just astounding. So I've been basically navigating the benefits, um, getting on disability again, but also GA, um, food stamps, or which we call EBT now. And, um, you know, food not bombs on my way to a, uh, um, a hanging out with some DJs at Radio Valencia last night. You know, got a bagel, which I should have probably, it's a little too hard now being in the back backpack all night. Um, I'll be fine. That's this difficulty. You know, if anybody wants to pay the $428.32 phone bill, then I can get my phone on again. Eh, you don't have to. No, that's, I'll be fine. Um, it allows me to see things differently. I've been going to St. Anthony's um, uh, for food every once in a while. And the people there, there's so much love. And there's so much um, camaraderie among some of the people who are poor. Um, you know, it's it's a Catholic charity. Unfortunately, Catholic charities pay my rent for last month up until the first of the year. So thank you payback for going to church every Saturday night or Sunday since birth to like 17 and a half. There's also a you know Jewish free loan um, group that wouldn't help, but I'm not Jewish, so that's perfectly fine. Um, it's a favorite of mine, the artist Paolo, um, Pier Paolo Pasolini who looks at what he calls the underclass, the sub-proletariat. And that's where my, you know, that's how I grew up. My mother was a nurse and in our home we had, um, she was a nurse um, for children with mental problems. And so when I was a kid, we had, um, we called them retarded kids back then. Apparently that's not, what we're supposed to say these days, but, um, um, you know, they grew up poor. Um, you know, we didn't have money much, but then, you know, with aerospace and my dad, you know, worked in you know, Polaris missile guidance systems and whatnot, um, which is very interesting, the history of, um, some of the first satellites, for guidance of nuclear missiles. Um, and um, yeah, I've been with bank presidents and junkies and the junkies are more fun. Well, some of them, I mean, some of them are the worst people on earth. It depends on which junkies. I mean, the people who went to um, the Naropa Institute for Disembodied Poetics and studied with Ann Waldman are different from the people that, um, you know, live in, um, shooting galleries and kind of not very pleasant people. Um, I think that's it. Um, after cancer, um, I haven't read books really. 
Um, but I'm getting back to that. The chemo brain is, you know, there's kind of holes there. Mark? And I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Okay. Um, and basically, you know, the last line is I'm getting back to using the tools that I've created for cognitive art to basically pay attention to the beauty of thinking. Um, and I hope to develop them and share them forever for free. That's me. I'll check in um, to just listening to what some of you have said. Um, so I, I think that the whole idea of check-ins, I think it's important to realize that there's different good purposes for, you know, to, to check in in the first place. And I think, you know, sometimes it might have to do with building relationships and hearing what's going on in somebody's personal life. Sometimes it's to be able to say what you're doing and hopefully Maybe there'll be some synergy and people connect and it can lead to a project. At least that's how I always think of check-ins here. Um, in addition, maybe something has something really burning that they want to talk about. I know when I come here, sometimes there's something burning that I just want to have like-minded people to talk about with. Um, that being said, my check-in is because I'm also interested in unification and I'm very interested in politics. I feel, for me, I've been trying to have a lot of conversations at a very, very basic level. You know, in my local community, a question like, do you agree that it should be illegal to buy pardons? And then just looking to see who can't even give me a simple no, or even a yes, if they think it, you know, whatever. It really weeds out the people, and I know who it's worthwhile to talk to, and other people see who's just nasty or difficult or whatever. But I think that with this new indictment around uh, Russian misinformation, disinformation, we saw a media company in Tennessee where two of the people got indicted where they found that these really big Russian, these big influencers like Tim Pool and uh, Benny Johnson were getting paid hundred, $100,000 for a video. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with Tim Pool, and I think this is really significant because I think the Ukraine issue is one of those issues that clearing up misinformation about that reaches people on different ends of the spectrum for different reasons. 
So there's a video of Tim Pool where he is telling you that Ukraine is the enemy, absolutely the enemy. Step two, we have him claiming that he's been a victim, that he didn't realize he was being paid by Russian disinformation money. And step three is he's coming out and saying he was totally wrong about Ukraine and we should support them. So I think looking at something like that is a conversation where people that are coming from different ends of the spectrum can possibly join together and at least agree on what's true and what's not true. And for me, that's where we have to start in any unification effort. Like what's, you know, what really happened, what's true, what's not because I can't imagine any patriot wants to be affected by false information coming from Russia. Even if you don't want to believe Russia is an enemy, you shouldn't want to get false information from anybody, even your friends. So that's, that, that's my check-in of where my interest is. And thank you. <laughs> oh, one more thing uh, to the point of bringing something up in case maybe there's a synergy. If anybody's out there that watches this that really likes making little pieces of content, I know for a lot of people it's so easy, it takes them two minutes. I would love to work with you to just guide a little bit and have these little pieces of content that I could bring to Facebook and have my friends share and make sure we flood, you know, just again, a paragraph or two just explaining the deeper situation of maybe what happened with Trump's negotiations in Afghanistan and how that played out, things like that, please contact me because I think in a very short amount of time, we could create some stuff to put out there and counter the narrative and create some decent conversations. Now I'm complete. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I go for the chicken. I'm major pumped out this morning. I just tested positive for COVID. And we have uh, $300 concert tickets. And I had a, I was supposed to get my uh, implant fitted today. And my, my, and I have an afternoon meeting for my hip. And I had to cancel everything. And it takes like two months to recreate those, uh, those meetings. So I'm like totally frustrated. But uh, yeah, I was I was uh, yesterday thinking, you know, after watching the debate and the aftermath of the debate, and then and then you think, how did we end up with a jerk like Trump uh, running for for office? I mean, how did this happen? Right? It's just insane, and and it seems like the spell has finally broken. Yeah. You know? um to to where um you realize the the insanity of of this whole thing but then 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 you also have to to uh, to, to acknowledge how deep this thing is running so yesterday on linkedin someone posted that ben carson is now the religious or the christian coordinator for the trump campaign and i think are you kidding me i mean you know, so so when you when you uh, when you take biblical teaching, particularly New Testament teaching, even in its most basic form, right? Then Trump just doesn't fit there. It just doesn't work. You know, so then either you believe the Bible is, and I have had people tell me every single paragraph is truth. Well, either you believe that, or you think this is a bunch of suggestions. And you can assemble them to make uh, everything work the way you think it should work, right? It doesn't go either way. But uh, there was one there was one part in the conversation, uh, in the debate, that I think where, where I noticed Kamala was really uh, the, the, the where the prosecutor look came out in her, and that was when Trump started. Uh, talking about the the Biden crime family, um, and uh, you know him accepting bribes from China and all this stuff, 
So to have this jerk go on national television and make accusations against a sitting president you know, of this country that are completely false, that are completely unsubstantiated, um, and, and just just do this, right? It's just so beyond uh, uh, comprehension, comprehensible. Um, so I think the, the 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 way going forward has to be to grab this guy by the balls in in a sense of uh, uh, who are you really, right? I mean, my God, you know, you, you, your, your son-in-law uh, has a father who uh, was jailed for tax evasion, right? And, and when you look at Trump's whole history, I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. So we are in serious trouble. I mean, if this guy actually makes it into office, holy smokes, you know? Um, the, and I, I look at it very closely, obviously, because of the farm bill issues. Uh, the farm bill you know, is the second largest bill after the military bill. Uh, I mean, it's trillions of dollars at stake there. And if the Republicans were to come back and, and control this, it, it would have an enormous impact on our climate change mitigation strategies because agriculture is now the, the principal player, uh, or not um, one of one or two uh, principal players in climate change. Now you can't fix, you can't uh, uh, get a handle on climate change without drastically changing the way we grow food. So yeah, so uh, <laughs> I was uh, obviously I couldn't sleep because my head is just bouncing. Um, but then you 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 think about all the argumentations that uh, that uh, uh, we should we should uh, have and talk about, uh, and not allow some someone with such a background and and such a nasty person to go on national television and bully people around and and uh, and say the things that he's saying. You know? So shame on us. I mean, I can't believe that uh, you know we got into this into this position there. You know, you know, intelligent people and 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 uh, you know what have you. But I think I think it is challenging our collective psyche in ways that may be good. You know, um, maybe we really needed this kind of wake up call, and hopefully it came in time. You know, for us to 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 really. Uh, um, uh, recover from from this slumber that we have been in, you know. I mean, when I when I hear uh, the economy is the worst ever, and I want to say, have you looked at your uh, stock portfolio lately, or your four hundred one k, or your house value? Right. I mean, the economy is tough for blue collar workers, and, and do you think the Republicans are going to fix that segment of the economy? It's the last thing they're going to work on, right? So the, the, you, you would think that we can structure arguments that cut through this nonsense, right? And, and the, it seems like uh, Kamala Harris and the team around her, uh, they're actually Disney guys in this, uh, are really taking a very thoughtful approach you know, to, to not say a whole lot, but what they say cuts. You know, it's just well thought out and, and methodical. Um, I'm I'm uh, messaging right now on the linkage between the soil microbiome and the gut microbiome, and so there is a there is a clear link, you know, where the the quality of the microbiomes in the soil transfers through the crops into the gut microbiome of our of of you know, our own of our own body, our own gut. And the health implications are finally coming out, are finally being published, right? And and it is dramatic. And so, um, so we're working, we're working, and I have this on the marketing. So so we have this farm to market uh, 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 project going, and and on the marketing, we're just scaring the dickens out of mothers in particular. Now thinking about uh, the food that you're feeding your children and what the impact is on the development of the brain and the development, even from a fetal perspective. Anyway, lots of stuff.
this is a pretty crazy time. You're muted, Kevin. Kevin, we haven't checked all in. Are you talking locally or are you talking to us? And he's gone. We're back in check-in mode. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll check in. Uh, first, I wanted to say, Mark, um, as to your bagel, do either one of two things. One, cut it in half and put it in a toaster. Or two, put it inside a paper bag, wet the paper bag, and put it in the oven at about 250 for a few minutes, and um, it'll moisten up and be, be lovely. So Stuart? Just, yeah? Already done. The okay. second one. <laughs> Good. So enjoy. enjoy. I didn't want you to miss the enjoyment of a bagel as a, as a bagel person. Um, I'm just finding myself in many ways um, trying to transcend the, the nuance and the detail of the political conversations. It happened to me in the legal conversations in that world, and it's it's starting to happen in the in the political world also. Um, and by the way, just for everybody, it's Kamala, okay, Kamala. <laughs> Kamala. <laughs> I remember her, her, her 10 year old uh, godchild, I think, taught everybody that the pronunciation is part of the, the DNC convention. It was a beautiful moment. Um, and, you know, as to Trump, he's a he's a symptom of unfortunately, where so many people are in society um, looking for the strong man answer. I mean, the classic example from the debate is when he mentioned, you know, Viktor Orban, who completely destroyed democracy um, in Hungary. Um, so tons of, tons of, tons and tons of arguments out there. And yeah, Klaus, I'm with you, wishing that we had a, um, um, some means of you can't go on national television and just make shit up like that because it serves your purposes. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what the exact remedy is, except, you know, we'll find out on election day, hopefully. Um, so the I'll do a little bad news, good news. Um, um, bad news is um, n not to repeat, but um, after kind of dealing with um, the pneumonia that forced me to cut my, my trip short, um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, um, my whole body um, just in pain all the time. So I had an MRI done. Um, this frightening. I think I have no discs left. <laughs> not, none at all. Not to mention the the stenosis in terms of narrowing stuff and the arthritic. Um, so I'm I'm kind of running, you know, and trying to trying to figure out how it is that I can um, um, operate this physical body um, going forward, and and so. Every day is a little bit of a new adventure, and I'm, I'm, I, I think I'm, I'm going to be able to get there. Um, but I'm amazed at what it's like when you have multiple stuff going on to navigate the current healthcare system in a large institution like Kaiser. It's just like holy shit, you know. And we're the smart ones. How do how do ordinary folks navigate this? I mean, it is a full time job. And it's a full-time job that that requires um, strategic thinking, because um, you're the advocate for yourself. You have to be, and you're the one inside your body. And there's no quarterback, and everything is just so compartmentalized. It's just it's just absolutely um, amazing. 
So um, I, I think I've finally gotten to the point where I understand what's going on. And, and so I'm doing my best. And then, you know, primary care doc takes off for six weeks on a vacation but doesn't leave a specific person in charge to cover like they used to do in small medical practices. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, it's not healthcare. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not healthcare. So um, that's my kind of small rant um, around that. Um, oh, the other thought, the other rant was, trying to cancel AT&T UVerse TV. <laughs> you have to have a phone call and getting a, getting in touch by phone <laughs> is almost impossible, <laughs> all right? It's like they've got you. You're caught in the maw of this system. And I was, I was, I had a note for a couple of days to find the Consumer Protection Bureau or the FTC um, because this has got to be a violation of law. Of, of, of somewhere there's got to be a protection in that. That's kind of an, a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and so the good news that I want to mention is that the Thoughtful Citizen Handbook, okay, the Thoughtful Citizen Handbook, which Jerry wrote a chapter for about technology, um, is... is Putting the final details on it, the cover. It will be an ebook uh, to be broadly distributed, um, and it'll be ready, I think Monday. Okay, so um, yeah, 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 just in time for the election. Um, so you know, um, it'll go out to the OGM group, um, and and we want to distribute it um, wide and far. And it's, you know, probably, it's about 30 chapters, each one about seven pages, six, seven pages about um, how each and every one of us can be more thoughtful citizens um, in the world. Um, so that's my check-in today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stuart, you uh, you triggered me to speak. I was going to go last because I, I'm an infrequent flyer. I, I work in primary care and I work on Thursday, so I rarely make that. And I'm on vacation for three weeks, by the way. <laughs> and I made and I made arrangements for cross coverage with my colleague. We do good job on that. It's still highly problematic. Um, interesting enough, I'm in Portland, Oregon at the moment because uh, my daughter's going through surgery. Uh, is recovering. My wife is staying at her, a small apartment, and I'm in a hotel room here, waiting for my my wife to come back because uh, we're going to be going to visit my sister who's in Portland shortly. And um, so much has happened, um, and I, I I just want to share a little snippet of my conversation yesterday. I was on a, a complexity scholars group call about the demise of primary care uh, with people from Alberta. Um, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. It was a small group, but we were lamenting how this, this systemic discrimination against primary care and how in different countries it's become victims to political polarization. And I didn't know until this Canadian colleague spoke that Alberta, she describes Alberta as the North Texas in terms of politics. Um, and the impact that it's having on primary care. The New Zealand guy talked about how it gone from a label to a conservative government, how farmers getting involved, affecting public policy, and they want to invest in pharma, but they're going to take the money away from primary care to invest in pharma and new drugs. It is batshit crazy. And one of the people there spoke about a book called The Political Determinants of Health by Daniel Dawes, which was published in 2020, which I... I read and I was I thought it was fantastic, but I said to the group, the biggest problem with that book is it doesn't get at the core issue, which is the ethics of healthcare. And that's why we need to have equity meta governance. I won't even go down that rabbit hole because that's a whole digression. But I was fascinated by the debate in many, many ways and actually sorely disappointed. She won, but 
that doesn't do much for 40% of the people who are in the, in the cult trance. And so it's good for us thinking, ah, oh, she triggered him and all the political analysis and whatever. So um, I, I sort of listened to many commentaries on the debate and wrote a song about it, which is called Unfit to Serve. And I'm writing two LinkedIn articles that I'm going to put the links in. I'm going to publish them. I'm, I'm just trying to sort out the details of them so I can publish them towards the end of this call. And if people are interested, they can go to them. And uh, if if people are willing and in the mood uh, to, to hear maybe half of the song, which is about a minute and a half, uh, if people prefer not to hear the song, that's fine. People can listen to, in their own time. So I wanted to get permission. Uh, in, in the spirit of democracy, um, I'm quite happy to go either way in terms of sharing the information, but I'll put the links in at the end. So it's entirely up to the mood of the group as to whether they would like to hear some hip hop ranting about uh, all the, the Trump supporters that have turned coat on him and the reasons for it, etc. So anyway, it's it's up to you guys. I'm flexible either way, and Jerry can oblige if people want to hear th half of the song. If they don't, that's fine. Um, why don't we uh, do that? If we do that, let's do that when everybody's checked in. Uh, okay. Gil wrote that he'd rather we not do it, uh, but uh, and if uh, and when we when we're done checking in, if you can put the link to it anyway in the chat so everybody can do that, I will. we'll, we'll deal with it then. So let's wait until everybody's checked in first. Thanks, Rick. Well, I'll go. Uh, I'm off camera today. Uh, I came in late. Um, I came into what I heard is a lot of rumbling, and I'm not in the mood for that particularly. Um, so I actually kind of checked out for some of your shares. Apologies in advance for that. Um, Stuart, you left me wondering whether, um, which is worse, trying to navigate the healthcare system or... AT&T. I don't think it's a toss-up. I've been, been trying to extract from AT&T in the past. Um, two thoughts. On the, on, on the political situation, um, I was really blown away by the debate and Kamala's performance and her playing of the Donald in that. Um, but we're baffled over here at um, how how strong the Trump support still is. And I guess we'll see, we'll see how the numbers move. And then, you know, it's too close to see the post-debate polls. Uh, but we've watched a lot of interviews with so-called undecided voters. And it's very strange uh, watching the experience of, of so-called undecided voters. So very different from all of ours. Um, you know, Ken's not here to enforce the we prohibition, so I'm going to use it. Um, so that's on the one hand, and uh, just a reminder, it, you know, she did very strong, but it's very close, and there's work to be done over the next 50 X days. Jane has written 100 letters so far. I've got a stack of 50 postcards here that I'm working through, and so I encourage people to do what you can to move the numbers. Because um, there's a possibility of a blue wave, and the politics are very different if the Democrats win big. And if they win marginally, then the unthinkable other option. So uh, do the work, folks. Um, the other thing I'll say um, in my own world here, um, I, I'm somehow back out in the world on the speaking circuit. I've got four gigs in the next month, some of them live. going to be doing a keynote in New York at Climate Week. And Jerry, I don't know if people mentioned Jerry's new uh, demo reel. It's awesome. See it, propagate it. Um, I'm gonna have to look at my. I'm gonna have to look at mine, which is like ten years old, and see how it stands up and what to do with it. But I'm I'm very interested in doing more speaking, um, both live and uh, and virtual at this point in my life. So, um, with the general theme of um, you know what might it be like if we did business as though we actually belong to the living world. And my invitation at Climate Week is to keynote a day-long thing that Cap Gemini, the giant French consultancy, is holding called Business to Planet. 
and they invited me to talk about um, what would it take to bring nature into the boardroom, to actually have standing in corporate decision making. So I'm, I'm building um, building a talk on that, as is my want. They wanted the slides like a week ago. I'm going to give it to them like, you know, maybe the day before if they're lucky, because the thing keeps evolving as I work it. And um, one of the questions I'm exploring, and I invite your input on this, is um, any examples of, of where that has happened, uh, where the living world or nature in some form uh, has a presence in the decision-making of corporations, different than an orientation to a commitment to valuing, paying attention to, but actually structured in. And on the one hand, I have the example of Germany where there's a statutory requirement for companies of, above a certain size to have workers on the board. Uh, as an example of instantiating the kind of broader stakeholder view. Um, and I've been looking into the, 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 the pattern of uh, uh, traditional indigenous Aboriginal cultures on that. And what I'm finding so far is not so much mechanisms, processes, as much as worldview, culture, way of being in the world, uh, which is maybe stronger and deeper uh, but also hard to imagine how you nurture that uh, in an organization that has arisen in this culture in these times. So I'm open to links, ideas, conversations about that and how I can really bring that alive uh, in a corporate audience that has some receptivity um, to thinking about these things in different ways. Um, um, and in parallel to all that, I'm continuing my work on the structural defects of capital hyphenism. Um, I've reshaped what I think is a pretty interesting book about that that weaves together my various threads. Uh, and so um, there'll be more of that over time. Maybe Neo book, maybe not. I don't know how public I want to be in the process of creating this. Uh, I think it probably needs a bunch of quiet gestation in the dark first um, before I share it. But we'll see how that goes. And that's what I got for you this morning. And, and Shemay, I don't know if I missed your share, but I'm glad to see your name on the participants list. Long time. I'll go. I, I'm going to pass today. Thanks. I was going to pass today, but I, um, with all the shares, the, the thing that I, um, that's living is um, that we have a body politic that happens to include all of it. Um, Trump and Trump followers and um, Kamala and her followers and all the other people who are confused in the middle. And there are drivers for every single one of those people uh, being where they are, taking the positions they're taking. And I think it's easy to forget that. And with that, I'm complete. And with that, if I'm not mistaken, everybody's checked in. Uh, go crazy on the chat. Post uh, whatever you couldn't post before, links to books, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Ken sent me an email before the call saying he's got food poisoning, so he's like trying to recover from that. Uh, Jamey was on the call, and then his internet borked, so he 
sent me a, a short note that said, oops, no internet. Uh, and then for Gil, uh, a thought on what you might do to bring nature into the boardroom. Um, I did some work as did Jame uh, with uh, John, uh, John Keo at the Idea Factory many, many moons ago, uh, south of market. And they invented a very cool process they called the Dilemma Dinner Party. Uh, Erica Gregory was their producer and she was had a theater background and she used to just really use the whole place they had in the organic building, like a theater set. And so they would have a formal dinner and people ask people to dress up in business suits for a client engagement. And they, it would be the night before a two or three day engagement. And they would show up and there was a long hall that, that took you from the door to the street to the door to the studio. And in that hall, uh, would there was a, a homeless woman and she was just sitting, and this is way before, way before the current mess with homelessness and everything in the city, but it's a homeless person. And she was sitting in the hall and she was like, oh, uh, do, you, do you have anything? And they'd walk by and go into the studio. And then the dinner, everybody would sit down at a big long table that they had set nicely with candelabra and they had waiters. And then a couple of minutes into dinner, there would be a tussle at the front door. And uh, this woman would sort of sneak her way past whoever went to meet whoever had rung the doorbell. <clears throat> and then she came up to the dinner table and said, um, that looks like chicken. It's, uh, I'm really hungry. It looks really good. And I, most everybody got it pretty quickly that this was an actor um, and that this was a setup. But for a moment, a lot of people's throats clenched and sphincters tightened because of the craziness of the setup. And her role, the job of the Dilemma Dinner Party, was to let the, the, the privileged people who were going to sit and plan strategy for a couple of days realize that there are people who were not present at the table. Um, and I think it was quite effective. I think it, I think it, I, I, and for meetings like that and things that happen like that, I don't know what the half-life is of that, oh my God, we need to think about those people, because it's, usually it's very short just like the, the half-life of any strategy session that's really deep and effective is really short because you go back into your home reality when you go back to the office. So all those layers have to unfold. But uh, there might be something there, Gil, where you you or someone or whatever can, can do something that makes its point uh, differently from just explaining it. And sorry for the long explanation, but I, I used to love some of the things that the Idea Factory had invented. They, uh, they were very smart about a group process. It, it it's good, and I'm I'm actually exploring some things that are a little little out of the normal presentation box uh, for the twenty minutes that I have in front of the room. But but um, the challenge is exactly what you say: is that you know the momentary perturbation of a of a like a, an experience is great. The question I'm facing is how do we, how do we get this somehow more embedded in the ordinary practice? whether it's through, you know, on the one hand, statutory policy, da, da, da kind of stuff, or on the other hand, the shift in orientation of people and how they stand in their bodies, in the body politic and the corporate politic ongoingly every day, you know, for years. So thanks, Gil. It's a great mystery. Thank you. Um, Rick, if you want to share the link to your um, song, please do. Uh, and then whoever else, whatever you want to pick up from the conversation. And at some point we should figure out, do we want to hear the, the first part of Rick's song or just hear it on your own? Uh, let us know. Just carry on. I'll, I'll, I'll get something into the chat shortly. Thanks, Rick. Mark, I'm pleased you are enjoying your, your um, bagel. <clears throat> and Stuart. Sorry, go ahead. Stuart, I can see your face in video um, when you talked, and um, I am concerned. I, I see differences, and um, there's a term called iatrogenic, which is a very difficult term, but it basically means harm done by doctors. Boy, have I experienced that. Um, thank goodness that the way I was raised I take responsibility for my own health. Um, mistakes were made, and I made them. Now, mistakes were made, and doctors made them. Well, um, 
we live in a world of trial and error. And it freaks me out that PhDs and artificial intelligence don't know what trial and error is. or And they don't know who um, H. Ross Ashby is. There's a, a historical anti-curiosity. If it's older than two years, it's ancient history. That bugs me about AI and the kids I meet doing it. And uh, Rick, thank you for your service. Um, being a, a healer um, is very, as important as being a teacher. Um, I've been contacted by shamans who are very interested in the kind of self-healing that I'm doing. They do ayahuasca, I do other things, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't heal somebody with ayahuasca. I, I'm not, no, I'm not a doctor. But they have training in plant medicine and um, we're comparing notes. Um, and the doctors, I have tried to get with the top specialists in the type of self-medicating that I've done. Man, it's just going nowhere fast but um yeah um they basically want me to be a patient and not a collaborator and that's interesting um i met with a brilliant man um whose name i forget i'll put it in the chat um oh william Irwin thompson and uh new york in the 80s i was about 21 and he was very famous at the time. That's about being a student. And he replied, I'm not, I'm not working with students anymore. I'm only working with collaborators. And that struck me. And that's where I'm at. Um, I'm not interested in being a patient for some kind of healing you know, clinic. I'm interested in collaborating and finding out you know, gas chromatography of my blood when, you know, certain things are happening. And that ain't, that ain't happening. Um, but keep on trying because that's what we do. That's who we are. Thanks and Stuart, my blessings to you. I wish you health and healing and love and communication. Being in social connection, I find that healing. Some people don't. Good luck. Well, thank you, uh, Mark. It's, it, you know, <clears throat> connection and hugs are the most important thing. And love. Um, most, most important thing. My late wife in 1991 was told she had three months to live with stage four metastasized breast cancer. She died in 2015 because she had a lot that she wanted to do. <laughs> um, but her first um, oncologist just gave her a big hug and said, get as many hugs as you can in your life. And it's um, it's it's really true. Um, and I think another piece is, oh, and by the way, Jack Park, who's part of the network who shows up occasionally, he he actually shared something with me early on in this myeloma journey that um, any doc who wouldn't collaborate with him, he didn't want to have anything to do with, um, which was a good, a good piece of um, wisdom. Um, yeah. I'm in contact with Jack Park. Jack Park is on... Um kidney um where you hook up with the machine dialysis mm -hmm. and um he's got i'm not sure what to share about his medical condition but it's uh um i think it's okay that uh, he's developed ischemia um little strokes and um um you remind me to call him today Stuart. thank you you're welcome
other stuff that anybody wants to go back to? Yeah, I just... Into, yeah, go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I, I had realized that when I shared earlier and I was talking about the different reasons for checking in that I hadn't made the point that I intended to make, which was that there's a flow to things and sometimes people will show up and they don't need to share, which is maybe why Pete passed, I don't know, but sometimes they do. So I'm a little bit uneasy about at least not building in a space at the beginning of the call. Should we decide to not do this every other week? It might be nice to just have a space at the beginning. Is there anything pressing for anybody before we start the call? So that's all I wanted to say, just to kind of leave room for things happen. <laughs> Just a, a, a moment, a momentary check-in with the community instead of a go around. Um, that's nice. Um, just a a a book that I received um, recently. I saw the title of it and it grabbed me because in all my musings um, and observations and explorations and um, it all comes back to the individual in some ways, healing themselves. So this wonderful book called What It Takes to Heal, What It Takes to Heal by um, Prentice Hemphill, um, How Transforming Ourselves Can Change the World. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, that's what the Trump camp needs. <laughs> they, they just are so over the edge in terms of taking uh, no responsibility for their own lives and thinking that um, some asshole can, 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 is, go, is going to fix it. Um, especially the folks with, uh, on the low income side. Um, it's just amazing how stupid uh, people can be. So, and also, and also on the other side, how, how smart even some of the Trump voters uh, can be. To comment directly, um, San Francisco has a general assistance grant of about $721 a month. Um, I found out if my rent was more than $721, I can't get it or people can't get it. Basically they say, oh, it'll all go to rent, it'll be gone and we'll just not give you the money. Um, so Catholic Charities had to pay my rent so that I could get GA, and then I have to figure out a GA. Um, apparently, you can get that and disability at the same time, but if you have more than one car, um, you maybe can't. So I might have to either junk or throw away the cars that I have, which you know I had always intended to fix the 450 SL, the 92 Saab convertible. And uh, I have a van, um, which I could live in for the next 10 years. No problem. It's a Toyota. And what, what Mark is just pointing to in some ways is, you know, the notion of um, as birthright, born into a human body given the resources of planet Earth at this point in time in the industrialized world, some minimum sense of safety net for everyone. I'm talking globally, because you know the resignation that people fall into um, is, is why you get, um, I think, um, radicalization and terrorism. So people have nothing to lose. And so they're prey to these groups. And um, with that basic safety net, people get to explore their humanity. Stay tuned, folks. I'm working on the manuscript. Mm -hmm. Not that I have all the answers by any stretch in the imagination. I just have the, the strategy and the direction. I'll leave it to others to fill in the details. Uh, Rick, go ahead. 
Yeah, you know, Mark, if uh, is he left? Is he still there? Oh, I think he Mark is there. Oh, is he? Oh, good. Okay, Mark. Yeah. No, I think eating a bagel. Okay, that's good. Uh, Mark, I appreciate your comments, and uh, um, I uh, it made me smile because I still love doing my clinical work. I love dealing with clinical complexity, and I'd like to focus on the complexity of Trump um in his mental state i wrote an article back in 2016 that had a phenomenal linkedin launch and it just took off with 700 comments about his unfitness to to serve and i'm just revisiting updating it but as this was going on i was tweaking the blog post that i i'm there's going to be a second one which will go into the details about the distinction between conscious and unconscious confabulation now confabulation is unconscious uh, it's where people just make up stories because they don't have a memory, but they still have the creativity to, to create bullshit. Conscious confabulation isn't really a concept, but I'm using it to de describe how uh, sociopaths and people with antisocial personality disorders confabulate, deliberately confabulate to manipulate other people for their own ends. Um, anyway, so the song doesn't go into those that level of detail, but it it in the blog post that I just posted there, if you like to click on it, because it just went live on LinkedIn, and if you like it, like it, comment, whatever, within two hours, it'll help to apparently help to promote it. But I'm going to have another one that I just want to tweet before and share at the end uh, to do the same. Now, I don't feel we have to listen to the song you can listen to it at your own time if you want to that's fine i'm very flexible but if you just look at the blog post you'll if you if you're on a computer you it's it's fairly brief and it provides the lyrics now some people have an aversion to ai music and voice and for those i suggest we just read the lyrics as though it was a poem so um whatever whatever preferred modus operandi you have for uh, taking in words, song, whatever. But actually, I'm, 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 you know, reasonably happy with some of the music and uh, the voice that can be produced with it. So anyway, look at it your own time, and uh, if you feel so inclined, comment, post, and reshare. And I'm, I'm going to put another link into the follow-up article that talks about the distinctions between conscious and unconscious confabulation, because. When you're dealing with complexity, when you have somebody who already has a pre-existing psychopathology and they're now developing a second one, it's very difficult to discern to what extent is he aware of his own confabulation or not. Some of the times, I don't think he is. And that's a sign of dementia, which is a much greater concern and was one of the reasons why Biden got kicked out, decided to get kicked out. Why the hell we can't do this? Give give Trump the same treatment and focus on that single issue of early dementia, raising doubts. That's all you have to do. You don't have to make a diagnosis. You just do what the right wing do so well. They play, they're the merchants of doubt. And if you haven't seen the documentary Merchants of Doubt, you must see it because they know how to play that, get that hardball game. So anyway, enjoy in your own time. Thank you, Rick. Um, Ramsey. Um, I mentioned in the past that I have uh, relatives who are Trump supporters. Um, and the only thing I can, you know, logically deduce is that, you know, they're low information. They, uh, they're not educated. Uh, what's weird, is, like I mentioned in the past, is that they are immigrants. They're, um, they're not devout Muslims, right? Um, but so I want to talk to some of them because I'm concerned this time around about the election personally, um, you know, because whatever he was trying to do last time, this time I really believe it's, it's kind of existential for our country. But what questions can I ask? Like what, I mean, one of the first questions I wanna ask them is, you know, did they vote last time? Um, because just because they're Trump supporters doesn't necessarily mean they're voters, right? We know that what a, a good percentage of the population of our country doesn't even bother to vote, right? So they may have opinions, but do they vote? So I'm curious about that. Um, but also I'm curious about like, what other questions can I ask these people to, to either, to get them to think, perhaps, you know, consider, uh, you know, the, the danger um, and maybe to convince them if possible to change their minds. Like, so, I'm struggling with that. I just don't know. I, all I know is that, you know, where they're coming from 
is that they don't they distrust the elite because they speak in a language that they're not familiar with uh, and they feel like they're being talked down to so i don't i want to avoid that i don't want i don't want to make them feel stupid right i want to make them um so that their opinion matters their voice matters um so that's my that's what i'm kind of concerned about so Rem remzi i'm hearing you and I'm 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 gonna say this as, as friendly as I can. It sounds like you're talking down to them because you're thinking that they're stupid. How how can they be so stupid? How can we convince them otherwise? I think there are a whole bunch of people who vote for Trump because they sensibly think the system is rigged and broken and they want to push a fire ship into the system. And that's one of multiple reasons I can think of, including other things like single issue voters on abortion or on a, a you know a conservative court or whatever. Um, who would who would not be stupid? They would be making a, a, a huge gamble. I, I think it's a huge gamble because he's such a crazy guy. But 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 they're reasonable. And the moment you start thinking of them as as not unreasonable, I think it's better. It, just yesterday, in my flood of too much info, there was a, a an essay from a woman who said uh, the man who saved my life, and it really was about reframing because she said I went on a camping trip and there was this guy that I really didn't like. Did we lose Jerry? For everybody? We lost Jerry. You lost Jerry. What I meant was that they're ignorant more than stupid. You know, I wasn't. I'm not suggesting they're stupid. They're just. They're just. They're just. You know, they're not informed. They, they, they don't read. They don't. You know. So Ramsey, what I the way that I would say that is that they have different interpretations of the information that they're getting than you do. They're drawing different conclusions from it than I would. Uh, some of the I was surprised by some of the um, um, uh, undecideds that I heard interviewed before and, and after uh, Vice President Harris's talk. And um, some of them, I, I had the kind of the same reaction you do of like, how could you be so dumb? Uh, but some of them were very thoughtful and said things like, you know, I don't know enough about her yet. I don't know how she's going to distinguish herself from Biden. I'm hearing generality somewhere. I want to hear more specifics. I don't know how she's going to pay for the program she's talking about. Uh, you know, not stupid questions. Also not questions that can be answered during a presidential debate, granted, where you got to do these little snippy things. Uh, but um, for me, it was surprisingly thoughtful, um, even though surprising to me that somebody could have not decided at this point. Um, in my experience, everybody has things they really care about. Like for real. And they articulate them in different ways. They interpret different strategies and positions from them in different ways. But in the occasional times that I've had actual direct one-on-one -on -one contact with Trump voters, which given the bubble that I live in, within the bubble, within the bubble that I live in, uh, I have found really interesting, uh, profound conversations where we have learned from each other and built relationships, um, changed each other's minds on some things, agreed to disagree on other things, and come out friends, which is pretty interesting to me. Rick, and do you still have your hand up? A little bit hopeful. Uh, Rick, your hand is still up. I don't know if that's from before, if you wanted to be in the queue. I, 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 no, I, I wanted to respond back to you, uh, Ramsey, because I think, you know, I, I, I'm not so worried about the word. I know what you're talking about, people being ill-informed or lacking information to make more informed decisions. Um, I've been active in this group called uh, Focus for Democracy, which is if you go on AI, you won't find much about it, which is very odd. But anyway, um, and it's an organization that raises funds to support organizations that are doing evidence-based uh, work in the seven sing straight states where they have that they demonstrate how much does it cost to get an independent or undecided vote to vote or register to vote. And it's data driven, which is amazing. Um, and there's an organization there called Working America. And the strategy they use is very sophisticated. And I'll give you a thumbnail sketch of it. They have two wings of their nonprofit. There's the, there's the partisan and the nonpartisan piece of it. The nonpartisan one you can give charitable donations to. And they go and they meet with working people like your, I suspect, like your, your family members to find out what their needs and interests are, number one. Then once they've identified them, they then use the partisan side of it to go, and then they try and provide information 
that deals with their particular issues that they're dealing with. So they will explain what the policy is of one side versus the other side to help them make their own decision. And I, I having heard, I forgot the name of the leader of the group who presented last night, uh, I was blown away by how sophisticated that was. And in some respects, that's what terrorist groups do. That terrorist groups go and provide needs for their community and get them hooked in and you know, indoctrinate them to serve their political party. So um, you might want to look at uh, their website. I don't know to what extent they go into that level of detail, but, but the message of the story is find out what their most, you know, what, what are their grievances and then see if you can provide information without persuading them one side versus the other and see how they make sense of the discrepancies of the two sides. Um, Pete. Uh, thanks. Um, two things, uh, uh, the, the election and uh, people, people making decisions the way they make decisions. I, I am kind of continually surprised how, how much we seem to like this group, and I'm not pointing fingers, maybe even at me, but this group, it, it sounds like we think that people can be logicalized. Uh, they can take a logical argument as you know a decision. <laughs> like, I don't think most people think the way that we think they think. Um, I think a lot of uh, most people feel about stuff. And um, you know, we have this academic kind of overlay where we've learned to gather information, do science, uh, make thoughtful decisions, or decide that we don't want to do that or whatever. I think a lot of people in our country um, and in the world never got that training in, in scientific science um, or rationalism or things like that. And so whenever whenever we say like, but don't they listen to, don't they find out, don't they, you know, what can I tell them? It's kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really like what Stacy does. She's she's a lot more like you know. I, tell me about you. Uh, let's have a chat. You know, rather than I, I got to make sure that you've got this information that will make your decision much more clear. It's like you know, people don't make clear decisions. They make gut decisions, and they go along with other people that they trust, and 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 they are swayed strongly by misinformation and disinformation and people who look like they know what they're doing um, uh, versus people who, you know, who may know what they're doing, but don't look like it. So um, Rick, thanks for sharing songs with us. Um, I'm glad we didn't listen to it in plenary. Um, music is super, super, super important to me. And what I have kind of found is that different music uh, hits people differently. Um, and there are things, songs that I love and will listen to over and over and over that nobody else really is interested in and vice versa. There's songs that are interesting and, and wonderful for most people. And it's like, I, I don't know why I have to listen to this. So I think it's, I think it's much better to share it by a link. And, and I lo love the way you said, by the way, the lyrics are in my post. You could just read the lyrics like a poem and that would work too. Um, I have to, I, I wanna share my experience with Suno, uh, which is what Rick is using to make songs. I stayed away from it for a long time because I didn't want to have like AI Drek uh, in my head. It turns out it's a fun little thing to, to play with. And I encourage people, if you haven't played with it, uh, to go check it out and, and make some songs. Uh, the ones I like best are the ones where you, you either write lyrics or you have a chatbot write lyrics and then paste the lyric in, and it write, writes some songs around it. Um, it's not bad uh, and it makes songs better than the worst songs you hear on the radio. It doesn't make songs that are great, but, um, uh, but I've got a couple that I don't wanna share with anybody, but they're earworms for me and I love them. So uh, it's a really uh, interesting, engaging uh, way to uh, do something with tech that you, know, um, you, you ought to sh share with yourself um, at least uh, soon. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. We are nearing the end of our call and we have a bit of a queue. So if we can be brief, please, Klaus. Yeah, I wanted to, um, in response to Ramsey, uh, what really helped me understand the the com communication in a more in a more structured way for left brain thinkers 
um, is spiral dynamics. Um, and I embedded this into my AI chatbot. So if um, you, it's pretty easy to identify people you are communicating with into either red or blue, you know, and when you when you do that, uh, you can actually ask the AI, here's the message, how do I translate this into red language? And it will do that. Um, because because the the it, uh, spiral dynamics talks about the cognition, yeah. Um, so when you when you, uh, I, I mean they, they they have these comedy shows where they're talking to Trump supporters and these people are just dumb, you know. I, I, I mean you can't say it in any other way. Um, and and the, so so to to challenge them and to contradict you know what they what they think they know gives us a good laugh but it doesn't change their mind now um, so the question then is how how can you get underneath this you now and and uh, and draw them out of, of this emotional state and you know like Pete was saying this is purely emotional there is no logic here and and another horrible thing to say is the, the way you train an animal for example you know by by giving it incentives and and guiding it and all this stuff when you when you are looking at the low end of cognition you know, in in spiral dynamics when you go to the very base of cognition you have people who are so overwhelmed with daily life and they they are so um they are so encased in their in their um, in their context, you know, the physical environment that they are trying to operate within. I mean, let's. I mean, there are people who don't know how to operate a credit card. You know? I mean, they they you know, they they can't uh, uh, do the most basic things well, so they're constantly overrun. So so that's the challenge is that they also vote, you know, and and uh, maybe not as many, but they do. Um, and that's really where uh, the, the this Trump message has taken hold. But then uh, on the other hand, I'm also sometimes really surprised when you have former business colleagues uh, who you always respected as a, you know, intelligent people uh, all of a sudden come up with, uh, uh, you know, the, the Trump is the man. So, so it's a. It, I, I think it, it is so context specific, right? So to put yourself into into the environment of the person that we're that we're communicating with, and so for example, I work with farmers, right? Uh, farmers are mostly Trumpers for whatever uh, 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 reason because they're getting screwed over by the Republicans you know, on a regular basis, but you can't talk with them about politics or about. Uh, you know, the 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 about Trump or all this, but you can talk with them about soil, um, and and about uh, the equipment they need to shift into a no-till practice and so on. So that's what I'm trying to say. You know, so to get into their get into their head and into into their, uh, their context. Thanks, Klaus. Mark. Klaus, I believe in making friends everywhere, and people are people. All businesses, people, all artists, people. It's it's all about people, and if you're a good person, and there are good people that vote for Trump, um, we can connect. Um, uh, very quickly, I just want to uh, highlight um, two videos. Um, the first is the one I posted last. It's uh, a radio station. I think I forget where it is. WZZK. Um, uh people a woman young woman um speaking um if math um should be taught in schools and um it's stunning the reasoning that they provide um and mostly it's no no we shouldn't teach math in schools um uh okay that is stunning um the other um gill i uh, posted um high up um in the chat um a woman homeless woman gets into first class on a plane and it's basically the same trick um it's a pretty uh what propaganda kind of video but uh it, it's an interesting example of of that uh 
um, trick. It's it's a little over the top, but um, I think you might find it interesting. Um, good luck to everybody. Um, I think luck is a great part of life. <laughs> so um, I wish it to that you. That it is. That it is. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Rick? Yeah, just to build on something you mentioned, Mark, and that is how to have respect and empathy for people. And that is the foundational premises of motivational interviewing. I won't go into that rabbit hole, but suffice it to say, the, the, the major aspect of doing motivational learning, how to do motivational interviewing is how to help understand people's emotional resistance to change so that they become more open to discrepancies in information that they can process at their own pace in their own time to make their own decisions. Um, and I, I just put in the uh, uh, an, another blog post uh, for LinkedIn and put the correct uh, thing for uh, my Suno channel. But I want to say one thing very briefly, Pete, about what you said. Yes, everyone should create their own song. It's a sense-making process. It may only be for you. You don't know who else. You don't know until you share it as to whether it resonates with other. To me, that's a creative force of how do you, are you a niche or you mainstream and anything in between. It can be for yourself, a niche, a large, whatever. So I think songwriting is therapeutic and we should be teaching all kids on how to do it. So you never know, Pete, you might have an audience you didn't know about. Love that. Uh, Stacey, I think you have the last word today. Oh, okay. Um, so I just wanna add on about detaching the emotions. I think it's, I think we make a really big mistake when we keep focusing on Trump's behavior and not on the behavior of those people who are viewing Trump, because it, it's our own thinking that we need to be questioning. So again, it, taking his name out, but still talking about the same issue is a little bit better of a way to, um, to get that process started. I also wanted to just say to really question the polls. I would not take them so seriously. I asked Gil in the chat where he had, you know, gotten that, you know, as far as the focus groups, because I, so I watched the debate for myself. So when it was over, I specifically was looking, I wanted to hear what Fox people had to say, because I don't have Fox. I had to go to a YouTube Fox feed and they already had set up a poll of who won. And of course it said 90% Trump, which was absolutely ridiculous. And I knew that at the moment. Similarly, as I scanned around in, in the time that's passed, I found certain people that I absolutely have no doubt, I would bet all my money that they were like a paid Trump influencer type of person just by listening to what they were saying. I mean, actually defending his decision about the Central Park Five. I mean, you can't take something like that seriously, especially coming from a black woman. That being said, while we were on the call, I just went back to one of my Facebook groups, which is made up of you know, all sides, constantly arguing, debating. So it's really pretty even mix. And in that poll of the 80, so 80 people voted, only five people said that Trump won. And those were the five whose names I recognize as putting forth this crazy stuff. Uh, 13 people gave, gave like a non-answer or a funny answer. I didn't look to see who they were yet, I will. And 70 people clearly said that she did, which is really what happened to any objective person that's watching. But my point is, be very careful with polling. Like I said, I've because the algorithms don't know what my political views are because I spend time in all these different sites. I've been enticed to answer polls and I'll get little Trump prizes for doing it. So they're going out of their way to influence polls as well. And rumor has it, there's like upwards of thousands of influencers that are spreading stories. So really be careful and stay locally, stay with the people around you that you kind of know and start asking questions. And Ramsey, just to you, in any conversation, it's important first to listen first to see what is it, you know, like what is that emotional driver to start with? Because until you know what that driver is, you, you don't know how to address it. Thank you, that's it. Uh, thank you. 
Stacy, thank you. Uh, I appreciate everybody staying after our regular time. Uh, thank you very much for being here and everything you said. And we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks.